Rudyard Kipling is a name that hardly needs introduction. His prose includes The Jungle Book and Kim, his poetry Mandalay and If. His children's books are classics. His shortest stories are renowned. He received the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1907. He was also a renowned patriot and imperialist. At the beginning of World War I, Kipling was appalled by German occupation of Belgium. He wrote pamphlets deriding what he found to be German acts of aggression and defending Britain as a champion fighting for a noble cause. He saw the war as the struggle of civilization against barbarism. His feelings towards the land of hope and glory, as well as his animosity towards the Hun being well known, he was soon offered a job as a war propagandist by the war office, a job he gladly accepted. But Kipling had an only son, a bright young boy by the name of John, born August 1897, a boy he dearly loved. At the urging of his father, John tried to join the forces of war. He was rejected twice, once by the army and once by the navy, both times on the account of his poor eyesight. But his father's influence finally landed him with the 2nd Battalion Irish Guard on 15th of August 1914, two days short of him turning 70. Shortly thereafter, John and his battalion were sent to France, incidentally when his father was there briefly as a war correspondent. He was reported missing in action and presumably dead during the Battle of Luz in September 1915 when he was only 18. The Kiplings soon received the dreaded war of his telegram, saying that the boy was missing. Rudyard had little doubt about the meaning of this, but his wife, Carrie, continued to hope desperately. This put a strain on the two's relationship that never fully left, since it was Rudyard who helped and encouraged the boy to join the army, while she was against it. This shook Rudyard to the core, causing him to write Epitaphs of War, which famously read, If any question why we died, tell them, because our fathers lied. But more relevant to our story today, this motivated him to join the Imperial War Graves Commission after the bloodshed had ended. In the spring of 1925, Kipling travelled to France. On 14th of March, he visited the war cemetery in Rouen and talked to the gardeners. That same evening, he began to write what he described as the story of Helen Terrell and her nephew and the gardener in the great 20,000 cemetery. He worked at it every evening and finished it at Lourdes on 22nd of March. The gardener is the story of Helen Terrell, a single, thoroughly English woman who is tasked with the rising of a boy, Michael, whom she calls her nephew, and who is born out of wedlock. In society, she is her aunt, but in private, she encourages him to call her mummy, a fact she asks him to keep a secret at all costs. Until one day, by accident, Michael overhears Helen explain the secret to her friends, a fact that deeply wounds the young man who is already insecure about his illegitimacy. Michael is hurt, and promises to hurt Helen in return. You have hurted me in my insides, and I'll hurt you back. I'll hurt you as long as I live, exclaims the boy, and swears to never call her mummy as long as he lives. He has passed, and Michael never goes back on his promise. The war starts. Michael abandons the prospect of studying in Oxford in favour of joining the army, much to Helen's dismay. She begs and pleads with the boy, but to no avail. Time passes. The pain of separation is compounded by the occasional leave or letter, giving Helen a glimpse of the boy. He is sent to a quiet sector in France. A month later, Rage Kipling, and just after Michael had written Helen that there was nothing special doing, and therefore no need to worry, a shell sprinter dropping out of a wet down killed him at once. The next shell uprooted and laid down over the body what had been the foundation of a barn wall so neatly that none but an expert would have guessed 
that anything unpleasant had happened. Michael, much like John, is declared missing, but there is no doubt in Helen's mind about the boy's fate. Missing always means dead, she declares. Years pass and battlefield terrorism becomes a thing. There comes a parcel containing a dog tag, a watch, and a letter informing her of Michael's fate. Helen is informed that there is now a grave in a French graveyard in which the remains of her niece are interred, a shrine she can finally pray to. Naturally, she packs her bags and heads for France. On her way to the cemetery, she meets an overly cheerful, inappropriately familiar, intrusive lady, Mrs. Scarsworth. She declares, overemphasizingly, that she is not here to meet any relative of hers, but is here on a commission. She photographs the graves of those sons the mothers, for whatever reason, cannot visit them in person. This is her nine time here, on a commission, of course and Helen endures her until the late afternoon, when she finally flees to the peace of her room. Hardly a minute has passed when Mrs. Scarsworth barges in, this time breaking down. She claims that there is a little matter that she needs to confess to Helen, and Helen, being a single woman, could perhaps understand. Her confession is that, while the other graves are indeed commissions, there is one grave, one grave in particular, that she visits for her own sake. The grave of a young man who, in her words, oughtn't have been, ought to have been nothing to me, but he was. And how that boy, who ought not have been, means the world to her. The next morning, Helen goes to the cemetery. She is shocked by the sea of black crosses, 21,000 in number, rearing their heads from the ground, all testaments to the immeasurable loss. She cannot find her boy's graves amidst the sea of crosses and unkempt bead. She wanders left and right, until she finally comes across a patch of welcomed grass, whose headstones have already been set, whose flowers have been planted out, and whose new sun grass showed green, yet she couldn't find Michael there. There, by the side of a grave, kneels a man tending a young plant. She approaches him, suddenly calm, asking him if he knew where him who she sought was. The man lifts his eyes and looks at her with infinite compassion, and turns from the freshly sown grass towards the black crosses. Come with me, he says, and I will show you where your son lies. Helen reunites with her son and leaves the man there, supposing him to be the gardener. Of course, John 2015 leaves little room for conjecture as to whom the gardener is. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, says unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. What surprises me is how much Kipling can fit into a story short enough to be read while waiting for the bus. There is as much written in between the lines as there is written in the lines. Obviously, the central thematic pillar is that of loss and how a typical English woman copes with perhaps the most devastating blow a parent could ever receive, the loss of a child. But entwined around this central pillar is the issue of legitimacy. It hints what motivated Michael to join up, despite Helen's attempts at dissuading him, is to legitimize himself and prove that he is indeed from the same blood as his ancestors. There is a Lancashire woman we briefly meet, while Helen is being briefed by a central authority of the military cemetery about the importance of knowing one's grave, who pushes her way between the two of them, and, 
not in so many words, explains that she does not know under what surname her son might be buried. Then there is Mrs. Escarsworth, who shares the same problem as Helen and recognizes her as being there to mourn her illegitimate son. But Kipling uses this theme not to shock the reader, but to have it serve as a backdrop to pose the question of keeping up a front versus the importance of truth and honesty. It is only between the two of them that Helen is mummy to Michael. It never slips from Helen's mouth that he is her own son, not even in her perfectly orchestrated displays of grief, not even to Mrs. Scarsworth, in whom she could confide. In fact, her reaction to her confession is one of disapproval. Mrs. Scarsworth herself has used her commissions as a front to visit her son, and her breakdown before Helen itself is because she could no longer keep up that front. Finally, there is the religious undertones. Helen has not fully come to terms with her loss, and one could say the fact that Michael is her own son until she is met by the man she mistakes for the gardener. This, obviously being a reference to John chapter 20, where Mary Magdalene mistakes a resurrected Jesus for the cemetery's gardener. It is not until Christ himself, who is pictured as a loving gardener, who nurtures flowers and brings them to life, calls Michael her son, that she is ready to move on, and to leave the cemetery, perhaps a metaphor for her past behind. In the span of two paragraphs, Kipling paints a beautiful picture of love and grace through which truth and resolution are obtained. It is Christ who is able to see the truth of the boiling emotions behind the calm and proper facade and console the pain of loss. But one cannot make a video of this sort without pointing out the parallels between the story and Kipling's own life and the divergences between the two. Unlike Helen, who immediately knows missing always means dead, John, and especially his wife, did not believe the son to be truly dead, and embarked on a four-year-long journey for his whereabouts. Of course, many a man had been reported missing and later turned up in a hospital or a POW camp. Unlike Helen, Kipling's son's body never showed up during his lifetime. The two never had a shrine to offer grief to. In the early 90s, the body of an unknown lieutenant previously buried in a grave for an unknown soldier, which has been located in St. Mary's ADS Cemetery in Haines, near Luz, was thought to be that of John Kipling. Even a headstone, later removed, was erected to that effect. But later evidence cast doubt on the identity of the soldier interred there. In January 2016, however, further research by Graham Parker and Joanna Legg demonstrated that the original identification was indeed correct. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission holds that the original identification is indeed correct, but nevertheless claims that they welcome any further research into the matter. Much like Helen, however, he did join a war memorial committee, the newly formed Imperial War Graves Commission, later renamed the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Much like Helen, Kipling and his wife made trips to France where the son was killed, even if there was no grave to visit. But of course, it is easy to forget that this is a work of fiction and only derives inspiration from the real world, and even that it finds in a hundred places. So perhaps it would be better to refrain from comparing the two. Well, thank you for watching this video and I hope to see you again in the next.